Welcome to Truth Telling with Elizabeth D'Alto, the show dedicated to focusing on the truth that is always evolving within us and around us, where we explore the potentiality of truth as a highly esteemed value at a time in history when most people have more on their plates than any one human should. This podcast aims to cut through the noise, the ignorance, and the complexity of 21st century living by exploring the truths of a diverse range of incredible voices. From authors, artists, creatives, and educators, to activists, speakers, and those in various scientific and esoteric fields, our guests hail from cultures and countries all over the world. On Mondays, we post interviews, and on Sundays, we post sermons, which are more personal and revolve around whatever I'm using on that week. No episode of this show is meant for everyone, and every episode is meant for whoever needs it on the right day at the right time, and you never know when that might be for you. Not all guest views will reflect my own, and that's intentional. We don't learn, grow, heal, or improve by staying in our comfortable bubbles with all of our people who look, think, or live exactly how we do. In this show, you'll get the full range. Everything from health, communication, money, success, parenting, desire, and spirituality, to making pivots and transitions in life, and topics related to psychology, storytelling, gender and race issues, emotional intelligence, and sacred activism. We can learn a lot from each other, and we need each other. You can expect courageous conversations when you tune into the show that will range from insightful, uplifting, and illuminating to uncomfortable and sometimes even confrontational. But no matter what, they'll always be filled with compassion and curiosity. Each episode invites you, with a ton of love and respect, to listen with your heart and mind wide open. If you love what you hear or find it useful and inspiring, the best way to show your appreciation is to share the episode and subscribe. Thank you so, so much for listening, and now for today's show. Hello, everybody. Happy Monday if you're listening in real time, and happy whatever day it is if you're not. This is episode number 247 of Truth Telling with Elizabeth Dialto, and today we have Kathleen Shannon with us. Kathleen is a creative director, podcaster, speaker, author, and mentor. She's the co-founder of Braid Creative and co-host of the Being Boss podcast. And through all of this, she has helped thousands of creative entrepreneurs from all over the world. So I was really excited to chat with her because you all know how much I geek out on creativity and creative processes. So Kathleen's big truth in today's episode was we're all connected. And we explored that through a number of really delicious threads, meditation, motherhood, branding and being who you are. And whether you're someone who has a business or not, or thinks of yourself as a creative person or not, because branding is all about identity and positioning, there's a ton of relevant points, no matter who you are or what you do. And then, of course, we got into various creative processes. She also, this was really fun, she also let me grill her about the time when she created a website and did branding for Brene Brown. So if you listen to this podcast with any regularity, you know that I'm not one to really fangirl, but if there's anyone I do fangirl, it's definitely Brene. So this is a really fun episode. It might be one of those ones you want to listen to more than once. And as always, find me on Instagram at Elizabeth Dialto. You can slide into those DMs if you want. Tell me how you liked the episode or comment on any posts we're making. If you have not yet checked out the trust assessment, that is over at thetrustassessment.com. We also have some spaces left in our Wild Soul Movement weekend workshops in Chicago in August and Asheville in October, as well as here in Los Angeles this coming May. So you can check all that out at wildsoulmovement.com forward slash WSM workshops. That's all the stuff I wanted to remind you about. Let's get into this episode. What's up, everybody? I have Kathleen Shannon with us today from Being Boss. Those of you who are watching have the pleasure of seeing her like amazing, fiery red lips. Welcome, Kathleen. Thanks for having me, Elizabeth. It's good to see you. So our first question that everyone answers is, what is a truth right now that's having a big impact on your life? Ooh, a truth that is having a big impact on my life. Is probably that we're all connected. Mm. Why is that having a big impact on your life? I'm just like every morning I go and I work out and then afterward I sit in the sauna and I listen to like some drums beating in my headphones and I just try and think about how our bodies are glued together in this matter. But it's is it real? You know, like what's real? Mm -hmm. And 
and then really trying to expand beyond just my own body and feel that we're all connected, even in a way that this sounds so dumb, but almost feeling like if Oprah wins an award, I'm winning an award, like trying to feel the feelings of like gratitude and accomplishment. And then I think like, is this just delusional though? And if we're all connected in this great way, where like, I'm also Oprah, does that mean I'm also like Donald Trump Yeah, or, you know, someone yeah, terrible does, if we're actually. like all connected in that way too? Yep. So that's the truth I've been battling with and celebrating in. This is this is a cool truth, and I'm glad you brought that up. One of my favorite, favorite friends on the planet, her name is Heather Lindemann. And what I appreciate about her so much, she's a bit older than me. She's going to turn 50 this year. And, you know, she's always that person who is standing for that part of the ego that wants to identify with Oprah but doesn't want to identify with Donald Trump. And she's the one going, we're both. We're all. We're all of it. That's what. Like, we are all one and we're all connected means we're not just all one with the Beyonce's of the world. Right. The shittiest people you know, we're connected to them too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think the other truth that I've along those same lines is just feeling really lucky to be a human being, even in like, I think about this a lot in the moments where my toddler is throwing a fit. So he's four years old and sometimes he can just be losing his mind. And I'll think, wow, like you're so lucky to be here. There's like a one in four trillion chance that you are even here. And how lucky am I that you're mine, even though you're throwing a fit right now? And how lucky am I that I'm getting to experience your total tantrum? And I know that this is, again, like this runs the line of sounding Pollyanna-ish. And I'm not trying to go there either. Like, I'm not the totally blissed out. Like, I'm yelling at my kid, too. You know, like, that's happening. (laughs) But just really trying to, like, hold on to this idea that part of the human experience is the shitty parts of the human experience too. And that we are lucky to be able to learn the lessons that we have to learn from the shitty experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I love that you bring up the part about your toddler. So I follow, I don't have kids and I don't actually, I don't want kids, but I love following accounts on Instagram that highlight cute things, hilarious things, silly things, and horrendous things that children do because it is so funny like just the other day a friend of mine posted an insta story that was her kid having like laying on the floor face down crying and then the caption just said this is because he didn't like his shirt (laughs) oh yeah that's for real I think that where it gets really tricky is like whenever they're face down crying and it's because you made them the peanut butter and jelly that they wanted to eat. And for some reason, it's not good enough. So before we started recording, you were saying that you've been really into meditation lately. And so I'm curious, is this a relatively new practice for you or is it just like a resurgence? Because you said lately. Oh, right. So yeah, probably a resurgence. I had a pretty solid meditation practice before I had my kid who's now four. Um, And then I've, you know, always dabbled. Like, don't we all meditate when we're like, okay, I'm I'm in a really good place. I can meditate or I'm in a really terrible place. I need to meditate. (laughs) Right, right. But as things are pretty even, I start to, you know, lose the practice. Like as things are just kind of flowing along and life is happening. Um, so I have gotten back into the practice of meditating and I don't know, I feel like I'm trying to learn a lot more about actual brain science and the why behind what it's doing and like what's happening in my pineal gland and, you know, like all the different things that can happen with brain waves and with, um, hormones that are happening in your body. And so that's really become my new motivation for meditating. So that's kind of exciting. So I'm curious, the reason why I ask is, uh, I was just, I was curious if you'd been doing it the whole way through since you became a mom. And I'm really glad that you didn't, cause this is what I wanted to ask. What do you notice between how you respond, how you're able to respond and be with your kid when you're not meditating and when you are? Well, whenever I'm meditating, I feel like we're all lucky to be alive, even in the tantrums. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm not meditating, I'm like, I made the worst mistake of my whole life. <laughs> I should not be a mom. 
I'm the worst. He's the worst. Everyone's the worst. And we are not lucky to be alive. Like yeah. that's kind of where I can go. So pretty solid case for meditation for anyone listening. <laughs> yeah. If you're not currently <laughs> meditating, if you've never tried it, or if you're off on your practice right now, maybe you want to pick it back up. You know, it's so funny though, like in this world of online and Instagram and whatever, if you had a before and after photo of me, like side by side, <laughs> I look exactly the same. Right. Because what is meditation? Is it necessarily working on the external landscape? It's internal. Even though that's what I'm working on too, is like the external. So after I work out, like I said, I sit in the sauna and I think about like that workout really getting into my cells. Oh, cool. Like I'm going I'm to meditate my way to a six pack. Yeah. Yeah. How'd you get that six pack? I worked out and I worked in. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really excited to talk to you about creativity. I Mm -hmm. geek out. One of my favorite things to geek out on, I don't know if you know this, probably not, is creative process because we're all so different. So before we get into that, I just, can you give us a little bit of your creative background? So for anyone listening who isn't familiar with you or who maybe doesn't listen to Being Boss, because this podcast is not geared necessarily towards entrepreneurs. There's many entrepreneurs who listen. But I know that's your primary audience. There's high likelihood that you're a lot of people are brand new to you and brand new to being boss. Yeah, sure. So my name is Kathleen and I co-founded Braid Creative and Consulting, which is a branding agency. And so that's my main gig. And it still kind of is in many ways. So I've had that for six years. So my background, even before Braid Creative, has always been working as an art director, like in advertising. And before that, I went to college. Um, I got my degree in fine arts. I thought I was going to be a painter, but ended up going through the graphic design program. But it was still in the context of a fine arts school. So I still had to take so many electives in sculpture and in painting and live drawing and serigraphy and all of that stuff. What is serigraphy? I've never even heard this word. Oh, that's screen printing. Oh. It's just screen printing. Oh, yeah. Cool. Fancy, fancy word. That's what the artists like to call screen printing. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I almost took lithography, but I got scared of the chemicals. Anyway, so um, real into creativity and really into art and thought I was going to be a full-time working artist. Then I got into the graphic design program And it was highly competitive. And this is probably where like the entrepreneurial side of me first started coming out, where whenever I learned 80 people were auditioning and only 18 got in, I was like, well, I'm going to audition. So I got into that and that kind of took me down this path of um, graphic design, which really led me toward branding. That's really what I became passionate about. And probably underlying all of that is this idea of really being who you are and this idea of. I know this word is used a lot, but it's the best word for it. This idea of authenticity and really blending who you are in the work that you do with who you are in life. Right. And so um, that's kind of been my driving force. So personal branding is a lot of what I've focused my career on is like helping solopreneurs blend more of who they are into what they do. But as I'm growing and expanding my business and working with you know, like higher education institutions and organizations, I'm also trying to find their personality and how we can blend that into their brand positioning and expertise as well. So that's what I do there. And then um, about three years ago, I can't remember if it was three or four. Anyway, a couple years ago, few, Emily, my co-host over at Being Boss, sent me an email and we had collaborated on some projects and we were having what we call business bestie conversations. Um, where we would hop on Skype and just talk about what was working and what wasn't working and what we were challenged by and what the newest trends were and how we could be scaling and growing our businesses. And so we were having these really honest conversations. And one day she said, hey, how about we hit publish on these? Why don't we start a podcast? And I said, yeah, like, why not? Having no idea what was ahead of us as far as you know, how being boss has changed the trajectory of our careers. It's become a whole other business on its own. We just wrote a book. I mean, we have big dreams for this, for this little brand. So we'll see how that goes. So I need to just take a pause and a fangirl moment because here on Truth Telling with Elizabeth Dialto, everyone knows I am obsessed with Brene Brown and you did her branding at one point, didn't you? 
Yeah. Yeah. Brene was a client. So yeah. How was it? (laughs) Oh my gosh. It was amazing. It was amazing. Brene is incredible. Um, So what happened was I received Daring Greatly while I was at a really small retreat in California and I read it cover to cover and it changed my life. Like even to this day, I tell creative entrepreneurs, like people ask me for my best business books and Daring Greatly is one of them. And it's not even a business book, but I think every business owner should read it. It's the business of life. (laughs) Yeah, the business of life for sure. So her work is incredible. And that book really did. It was a pivotal moment. It was one of those things that changed my life. And so then I wrote a blog post about it. I did a review. And I think I tweeted it at her. And she tweeted back and was like, thank you. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, I had my fangirl moment there. Yeah, because this is, what was that, like, 2014 before, or 13 even? Daring Greatly came out in 2013, I think, right? Yeah, it may have been 2013. So she wasn't like the Brene she is now. She wasn't yet. So she was still answering her own tweets, huh? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. And so then... Pro tip to anyone who makes wants to make friends like this, leave an Amazon review. Like the nicest thing you can do for the people that you admire and the books that you admire is to leave an Amazon review. Like that can be huge in the success in their business and growing. So I left an Amazon review as well with an excerpt from the review I had done on my blog post. And then a few weeks later, I open my email and I see an email from Brene in my inbox. No, like from like yeah. Brene, Brene from Brown. Brene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't uh, need to tell me your email address, but okay. it was like, it was from her team or it was like. No, it was from her. Oh my God. And she said, hey, I've been following your work since you did that review and I'm about to go on Oprah. I need a website overhaul. And at the time, like we weren't even designing websites really. I was like, <laughs> but you were like, done. we're doing this. I was like, so here's our braid method and here are all the steps that we'll go through and the meetings that we'll have. And she is like, I will pay you double if I don't have to do all those meetings. <laughs> like, can you just make it look good? <laughs> and I was like, no, you have to go through all the meetings. That's how I do my work. That's my process. Like I can't do it without understanding who you are and you're not going to get what you want out of it either. And so she went through all the meetings and she was grateful that she did. And I designed her website. It was like probably one of the last websites I've designed, um, which has been why not? updated. Just since. drop the yeah. mic. And what's funny about that is I got pregnant and I was probably right around 12 or 13 weeks. Whenever I flew down to Houston, I was sitting in her living room designing her website together with her. And um, I had this moment where I was like, I'm going to throw up in Brene Brown's bathroom. <laughs> And then I told her, I was like, I think I might throw up. And she was like, okay, let me get you some shortbread cookies and strawberries. <laughs> and like, so then Brene Brown is serving me shortbread cookies and strawberries so I don't throw up in her house. I'm so jealous. Yeah. So, so but awesome. she's, she's incredible. And the work that she does is amazing. And her um, entire team has grown so much. And the work that she is doing, I mean, I... Almost all podcasts I listen to, someone eventually makes mention of her. Even yeah. today, I was listening to Katie Couric interview Laverne Cox, and Laverne mentions Brene. And wow. I mean, just so good. And she speaks in like these nuggets of wisdom that are so tweetable. So tweetable and so understandable. But then this is why I love her so much because she has the gift of articulation. She has the ability to yeah. say things in a way that we could hear them and understand them. Yeah. Even today, so I was listening to that interview and I texted my husband, choose boundaries over resentment and then credit it Brene. And he gave me a thumbs up and a whiskey glass in return. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. Cheers. <laughs> but I mean, I just feel like the things that she is teaching and saying, I, it continues to impact and change my life and... Yeah. yeah. Love her. Love her work. And so I'm super curious to work on something that I imagine had so much more meaning to you because it was her and because her work had impacted you so much. What was that like? Um, honestly, I'm so rooted in my process. And I think that I trust myself enough in that process that it wasn't much different than working for anybody else. Cool. Like it felt very like the process felt very much the same because she was in it in the same way that anyone else is. Um, she's very much human like anybody else. And 
So it just felt really super normal. And I definitely had those moments where I was like, oh my gosh, like, but you know, I'm sitting in Brene's living room about to throw up, but also really stress out about, oh my gosh, is this website looking good enough? And then having to take that moment to kind of like get out of my body and say, oh my gosh, you did it. Like if you had told myself two years before that moment or six months before that moment that that would be happening, I would have lost my mind. I would have thought I have arrived. And here I was stressed out about like making sure everything was pixel perfect. Right, right. You know, so I still had my moments where I was stressed out too. And I think that taught me a lot. And, you know, also seeing her have her moments where she's stressed out too. And I think it it taught me a lot that, you know, no matter what level of success or what goals you hit, you're still going to have to work through whatever's happening. And that's just the process of life and of being human. I remember thinking even whenever I was in college that once I got a job, as an art director at an advertising agency, I would never have problems with my printer ever again. (laughs) Like that, like Like, magically. Like your physical printer? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Because that was my biggest point of stress in college was like printing off mock-ups of my designs and getting them together. And my printer either running out of ink and I couldn't afford ink or something jamming or just not working. And I thought I will never have this problem whenever I work at an advertising agency or, you know, somewhere professional. There's still printer problems, if not more, because the printer is bigger and more expensive and harder to fix. Yeah. But how lovely that like your biggest problem at that moment was the friggin' printer. Right. Hashtag for sure. Simpler times. (laughs) I know. I know, right? <laughs> so, all right, take me through. Are you, are you able to share a little bit more about the braid method? Because again, I love creative process. I'm I'm in one right now. I'm creating a whole new. I'm essentially creating at the time of recording this. When it comes out, this will actually all be out in the world. But I'm creating this 64 question trust assessment, and then um, so there's there's a couple of different types of reports people can. Um, There's a free report, there's an advanced report people can purchase, and then there's a workshop that I'm going to run to like help people understand themselves better and how they can apply what was in the reports. Um, And then I'm creating some new training programs as well around this concept that trust is the number one problem that people don't know they have. And if I remember back to my interview on your show, we talked a lot about trust. So anyway, I'm in that creative process and as well, because I'm a manifesting generator in human design and I just can't help myself, I decided to also go into a speaker training program. So all of the things are, and I'm building a new website, elizabethdialto.com. Why am I doing these three massive things at once? Because it's, I can't help myself. So um, noticing the resistance, what? What's the speaker training program? I need this. So it's a beta program, actually, with one of our former guests on the show, Jill Wesley, who I met uh, last time, uh, almost a year ago. Uh, It'll be April. Everything moves so quickly. I'm like, it's February, April, almost a year, whatever. Um, It all comes out in the wash, two months. So um, I met Jill at this thing, and I loved her. And I knew I wasn't quite ready yet, but now that this new body of work is emerging, that's what I want to build my speaking platform around. Because it's just a lot more wild soul movement stuff is amazing and it's not going anywhere. But this is going to be uh, more palatable to more audiences and actually help me to be able to connect with people who aren't necessarily just in, you know, preaching to the choir, the people who are already spiritual seekers or on the path or interested or curious and into self help, but like to go into different environments where people, what I've been fondly referring to this new customer avatar as is the napping potential, right? They're not asleep. They're not entirely awake. They're maybe taking a nap and they have so much potential that they probably don't even know they have. So anyway, um, yeah, so Jill has, uh, she's teaming up with someone who also helps people build their social media platforms. And so we're going to be testing out like content and big points of the talk on social media. So I'm sure like most entrepreneurs, have you read the four hour work week at any point in your life? So I tried, (laughs) (laughs) you know what I couldn't get past with, and I still listen to his stuff and I even listened to his four hour work week revised podcast that he just released anyway, was the outsourcing to the Philippines. Like I got so stuck on that, that I never read, I never read any of the book. Like I threw the baby out with the outsourcing to the Philippines. Oh my God. So anyway, for anyone listening, we're talking about Tim Ferriss, his first book that came out in 2007 called the four hour work week. 
And but one of the things that he talks about in the book is validating your ideas. So, you know, being able to test it in some way, shape or form. And in 2007, that was much different. In 2018 now, like there's Facebook ads, like you can throw anything out to a very highly targeted audience. It's like one of the most refined and easy and instant ways to get market research. So um, I brought that up because we're going to be doing that as part of the speaking training as well, which so that the combination of the two things was what got me really excited. But I digress. All of that was just to say that I'm working on some mega stuff right now and learning a lot about my own creative process. So I really want to hear about the process that you take people through. Yeah. So the process that I take people through really starts with homework. And so my clients get a literal deck in the mail of cards. And I think that so much goes into that pen to paper process. And this is a process that we developed, I mean, five, six years ago. It's been the same ever since. And some of the exercises have been modified or updated, but it's really a way that we can start to drill into that discovery and really get them thinking about their brand in a different way. Um, So some of those exercises are actually kind of metaphysical in nature. I was going through the school of metaphysics at the time, and one of the exercises is called past, present, future. And it made me think about kind of memory, attention and imagination and really um, digging into that aspect of it. Like I I kind of like on the sly (laughs) bring in all this stuff to my clients. They don't even know. But um, really looking at, you know, past accomplishments, present moment, like where are you at now? What are the two things you need to focus on in your brand next? Um, And more from like a positioning place, less than like I need to update my website. But we also ask them where they're going next. So, you know, what is your big vision for your brand? And I think what this helps people do is really compartmentalize because I think a lot of creatives come to us and they're like, oh, I want to do all the things. And they either become overwhelmed and paralyzed by those things. or they, you know, or because of that paralysis, like they never move on yeah. and do those things, or they're stuck in the past and what's worked and like what they've already done and they never move forward. So it really is a good way to dissect like, okay, here's a map. Even recently though, I thought, how could I, how could I update that to be more of like a spiral anyway? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But because I've also been thinking about time a lot and what is time. Anyway, I'm not going to go there with my clients, though. And then we also get into stuff, though, like, really, can you explain what you do? Like, and how do you actually do that? So we have an at Mad Lib style fill in the blank script. Like, my name is blank and I do blank for blank. It's kind of like blank. Yeah. And really get into it that way. Um, another thing that we do is we have them look at different aspects of their personality by pretending that they're at a dinner party with other brands that they admire. That's and cool. that's actually an exercise that made its way into um, the Being Boss book that we just wrote. Oh, and nice. yeah, shameless plug there. Well, we're going to talk um, about it anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> no, I know. I know. So we take them through this process where they're going through all these cards and all the cards, I think, start to unfold this discovery process. And we really, so then we meet with them over Skype so that we can see who they are and we have them read their cards and we start to take note of patterns and disconnects. So what are themes and words that are coming up over and over again? We listen to what they're writing down and oftentimes they'll write something down. They'll put the card down and they'll say, okay, but what I really mean is blank, blank and blank. And that's whenever they'll say it in their words. And this is why this part of the process is so incredibly important, because I think that a lot of us do this. Like we'll write something in our blog post and it sounds very professional and official. But what we really mean is the thing that we're saying to our business bestie or the thing that we're saying out loud to our client or the thing that we're saying over coffee to our best friend. And why can't we start to say those things that we're saying out loud like in our content that we're creating. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's where we really kind of start to capture those patterns and disconnects and what they're actually saying and what their vibe is from what they're wearing to the tone that they're speaking in. Um, you know, sometimes we'll even ask one of the things that we ask them is, okay, what brands inspire you? And it's a very basic conversation. Like, let me see your Pinterest board. Um, but what brands inspire you? And everyone always says Apple. And I even did, I even did a slide in one of my last presentations that said, okay, let's talk about Apple. And I actually dissected what people actually like about Apple whenever they say they like Apple. Um, Because I think a lot of that stuff like Apple and Nike, you don't really necessarily like the brand identity or what their website looks like. You like the 
what it's made you feel like over the years or the impression that it's left upon you that has cost billions of dollars in advertising for them to brainwash you with. Yeah. <laughs> you or know what I mean? they're only they're one of the only two brands you can actually think of off the top of your head because they're right? so out like as you were saying that I'm like I don't I don't know. I don't have brands that I ad- admire really. As I was I, it's like the standards, right? Like people say Apple, I think you probably hear Virgin a lot, right? Those are kind of like the popular Yeah. Yeah. I don't have, I was speaking with a a woman who has done some brand identity work with me before I actually decided to go rogue and just do this project myself uh, because I'm a weirdo, but, um, she had sent me a couple links to a couple sites and it was just so fascinating. I'm like, I don't do this. This is not something that I have my finger on the pulse of. And so I'm curious, do a lot of people, do they spit out brands? Do I really like this? I like, I, as a, as such a, prolific creator of content and things, I am not a very good consumer. Same with the podcast. When I created the podcast, I didn't, I didn't, I still don't really listen to that many podcasts. I'll listen to like an episode here and there. Like I just saw on Instagram, Brene Brown was on On Being. I'm definitely going to listen to that in my car ride up to San Francisco tomorrow. But other than that, I'm not like a podcast listener. Right. I know. And I find this to be true for most other creatives as well. Like they're not consuming a lot of content or the brands that they're really inspired by are other personal brands like Brene Brown. Yeah. Yeah. And how, you know, I mean, I was able to take her brand and bring it into a brand identity, but so much of what went into that process, which is the process I'm explaining to you now, I think if I just presented her with that design without going through the process, Mm -hmm she wouldn't have loved it as much as she did. Yeah. And so even as you were saying, I'm doing it myself, I wrote down the process is the process because you, (laughs) which is like, duh, but I don't know why I wrote it down that way. But what I'm trying to say is sometimes you need to go through that process of like figuring it out yourself or collaborating with someone along the way in order to have full buy-in and to have the confidence to really be behind it and to put yourself into it. But if you lack the skills to like literally push pixels around or to craft your copy in a way that is concise and isn't confusing your dream customer or it's not, you know, diffusing your own expertise, then yeah, like that's where someone can really help you do that. Um, And that's another thing I want to talk about was, you know, part of our process is looking at who is buying your thing, whether that's your service or your product or your jewelry or whatever. I think a lot of brand like brand experts start with the dream customer first. And I really like starting with the creative or the the organization or whoever it is that I'm working with. I really like starting with them first. This is cool because I come from the B-school world. Like my family of origin and entrepreneurship, aside from like the sales and marketing background selling Cutco knives, is the Marie Forleo world, which is exercise one and B school is start with that ideal customer avatar. And I'm so thank you for saying that. It's interesting. You probably noticed this too. I think you were saying as, as you were studying metaphysics and then you were looking at this process, you were like, oh, wow, there's metaphysics built into this process. Like this goes back to what we started out with. We are all connected. Also like literally the mind, there is like hive mind, collective intelligence is a real thing because there's so many things across the years in my business that I was doing that no one ever taught me, but it's a thing. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh, damn, that's real. It feels cool when you find out that it's a real thing or there's a framework and someone validates it for you. Because I was always so resistant to starting with that customer because I was like, but I, I don't want to create for this person. I want to create something and then let the ideal customer emerge. So that's kind of what I've always done. And then you end up with like a handful of clients that were like your favorite clients ever to work with. Some of them might be listening to this and they know exactly who the hell they are. And you're like, I'm like, yes, I just want to create more things for that person. So I think about it whenever it comes to having a house. I know that you live, you rent in Malibu or do you? Okay. So have you ever bought a house before? I have. I've never wanted to until I moved here. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Well, there's this thing that happens whenever you buy a house where people always talk about resale value. Like before you even buy the house, (laughs) they're talking about how you're going to be reselling it later in the future. And you want to make sure that everything you're doing, every decision you make 
is for that next person that is going to be living in the house that you are buying with your own money. This is dumb. Right? This sounds very dumb so to me. Whenever you buy your house, they're going to be talking about resale value, but you need to do whatever you want. If it's tearing down walls, if it's yeah. putting green subway tile on your in your kitchen, if it is or whatever it is that you want to do. Don't worry about that resale value. I just think it's so dumb. Like, why am I designing my house for this basic person in the future who I don't even know exists? Like, why don't I create my dream house for myself? And then one day, if and when I sell it, it will attract the exact right buyer who loves my sense of style and is willing to pay even more for the fact that I designed it exactly the way I wanted right? it. And this is because this is how our culture functions. Everything is externally oriented, right? That's still so much part of the mindset, doing things for others, putting other people's needs first, people you don't even know. Like this is people a great who are not example. even real people you don't even know if they exist. <laughs> Instead of putting your own needs, wants, desires, and dreams ahead of And it these- waters it down. It yes. waters it down to the point where everyone has like ugly granite countertops. No offense to anyone who loves granite countertops. Oh my God. I have a hilarious story. I'll keep it short. But I had gone to a dance class with a friend of mine on the East Coast. I was visiting. This is a couple years ago. And we're in the dance class. And it was like a dance hall class. Like we got down. It was amazing. And all these girls. It was like in this suburb in like the New York Tri-State area. Very, very, very white. And this is like, girls are like getting down. I'm like, damn, who knew these white girls could dance like this? It was like my experience. And, um, and then after it's like one of the girls who was like the best, because if you're in a dance class like that, you're looking around, or at least I am, because I, I have so much respect for people who can move their bodies in amazing ways. And so I, to me, the girl who was like probably the best dancer in the room afterwards is in the lobby asking her friends, no joke, which color of beige she should paint her living room. She had beige swatches. And I'm like, this is the paradox of our times. <laughs> oh, my God. Nothing wrong. Like, I had no judgment. I was just no, like, damn. I know. I just... Based on the experience I just had in that sweaty room with that amazing music and those dirty dance moves, I know have expected that this person was painting their living room beige, but they were. I know. Maybe and, it was you for know, the resale value. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and then we just started appealing to like the lowest common denominator. Yeah, Everything beige. just gets so beige. What's up, beloved listeners? Quick break in the show to remind you that the trust assessment is alive, it is kicking, it is out in the world. And if you have not taken it yet, what exactly are you waiting for, friend? It's over at thetrustassessment.com. We've been receiving amazing feedback from the people who have been taking it since we put it out. And what's really cool is whether your trust in yourself is low, whether it's you know medium, mid-level, so-so, or whether you have a lot of trust in yourself, in the reports that are associated with the assessment, you also get to learn a lot about how to apply trust in your life, the specific context for trust in the different areas of your life. There's a lot of information there from my many, many years of study, practice, observation, and experimentation with myself, with students, and with clients. So it's super useful. The resources beyond the free report are super inexpensive. There's an advanced report. There's a workshop. I have a bunch of workshops coming up in March and April. So if this is something that you're curious about, you want to know more about, whether you want to see how you could apply in your own life or maybe you have your own clients or your own people in your life maybe it's your children and you want to be showing them uh, at an earlier start than you got how to trust themselves there's some really useful and really valuable information for you within all of the resources that come after you complete that assessment it takes about five minutes so you need a little bit of time and it's totally worth it so again head on over to the trustassessment.com thank you so much for checking that out if you love it and you want to share it with your people we greatly appreciate that as well. And back to the show. Yeah. My walls are beige. I just moved from Oklahoma City to Detroit oh, no and way. I'm renting for the first time in like a decade and the whole house is beige. And I just can't help but think about the beige doesn't offend me and I'm glad I'd rather it be beige than like have crazy colored walls all yeah. over the place. I'd have to like paint over. But, you know, I just question people's the decisions that they make and sometimes the decisions that are in poor taste cost just as much as decisions that would have been beautiful. Yeah. Anyway, so all that to say, yes, put yourself first whenever it comes to your branding, yes. do what it is that you want to be doing. Um, so from there, we um, 
we go back and we create this like interim document. So before we present the final brand platform, which includes a brand identity, so stuff like logo and what we call conversation slides, which is like almost like a mini website, like a PDF deck that you would send to a potential client um, and, you know, creating social media graphic templates and things like that. We have this middle point where we check in and we say, okay, here's all the things that you said. And we start to frame up the quotes that they said as well, like the things that they said out loud that we captured for them. We're starting to put together look and feel and graphics. And so it's kind of the opposite. If you've ever watched Mad Men, you know, like Don Draper goes into this room and is like, and here is your brand and let me read it to you. And it like really selling like and in those moments, you have to really sell the pitch. Right. But this is such a collaboration that it's like, okay, tell me what you don't like in here. Tell me what you do like in here. And so we're having this middle checkpoint along the way so that whatever is coming out in that final brand nine times out of 10 has like total sign off. And the you know, small percentage amount of the time where there's not a total buy-in. It's like really small tweaks that have to be made to that final process. And it's because we collaborate with our clients along the way. So it is almost like as if they could do it themselves, but don't quite have that, you know, know-how or guidance or technical skills that it takes to design a brand platform. Yeah. So I have a really personal question because I find... I find it actually so useful when I have people who are doing for me what you just described, right? Especially asking me these types of questions and getting me to articulate things that maybe I haven't articulated before. At the same time, it pisses me off so much. I have such resistance to it. Ooh, say more. It's just like, I don't want to have to tell. Why do I have to tell you what I mean? You know, like... (laughs) This shit works. Like I know, you know, there's just something about having to articulate, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that these are, some of it is like my deepest soul's truths and wisdom. And a lot of my stuff is coming from a place that is so not in line with our cultural programming. It's almost like I'm preparing to go into battle to have to stand up for why this is how I do things. That actually might be it. Maybe I'm articulating it. Look at you having the effect and you're not even doing it. Um, Because it's like I'm I'm almost like anticipating having to defend that my way is different. What if you went into it not feeling that defensiveness? Yeah, I think that's an obvious (laughs) answer right now. Yeah, I'm excited. (laughs) And, and I think the difference now at this point that I've done things like this several times, I understand the value and the benefit and I know what the outcome is going to be really, yeah. really, really worth it. So I'm willing to keep going instead of being like, this isn't for me, which is what I used to do when I was stubborn. But I bring that up to, see, to ask you because I'm curious, again, back to creative process, people are different, right? What is it? What's like the range of, so I'm like the, the angry, stubborn person who doesn't want to have to explain her methods. What other kind of like... How do people respond to the process? I mean, I think that, you know, we created our brand and our process for ourselves. It's how we do our best work. So we're attracting people who want to go through the process. They are craving that kind of structure and guidance and trusting from the brand that we've created for ourselves that they're going to come out the other side with a beautiful articulate package, right? So they're, for the most part, like really excited. And if they come into it defensive, we'll say, okay, I we're probably not a good fit. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. you're not afraid to say like, there might be someone who's better for you. But one thing I wanted to say about what you just said is that I think that whenever you have these like deep inner truths and that is in your brand, Like those deep, that really deep wisdom, there's no language for it. That's the thing. Right. And so that's probably your life's work is being able to articulate this really deep wisdom that there is no language for that you just know as this truth. Right. Yeah. And the tricky thing and kind of the shitty thing about branding is that it's just the outer layer. Like the definition of your brand is that outer layer. It is that Mm. outer layer of the onion. And people aren't going to get to those, you know, really deep parts unless they venture further. So how do you make that outer layer give a hint to what they can expect whenever they go deeper and whenever they can get to that place with you in your business where you don't have to 
say any sort of surfacey bullshit. Yes, yes. I love this point because as well, you know, there there's there are values that are really important to me. Um, you know, justice, treating people well, like not psychologically manipulating people. And at the same time, like you're saying, if this is the outer layer, depending on who that market is, like the market that I'm moving towards now is going to be people who aren't as far along on their growth or development path. So I actually am going to have to choose language and articulations that those people can hear that would feel manipulative to people who have a higher level of perception. And yeah. I actually spent almost all of last year, that was something I was really reconciling, but studying things like integral theory and spiral dynamics, I'm like, oh, this isn't about being an asshole. This is actually about doing the high service of speaking to someone in a way, meeting them where yeah. they are so yeah. they can actually hear you instead of being someone, and it was an ego thing too, who's like, well, this is, I, I only want to speak to people who can understand my way or my message. That's not helpful. I know, you know, I love that you're saying this because I deeply admire Marie Forleo. I think that what she's created has been incredible, but sometimes I'll watch her stuff and I'm like, man, I feel like she's dumbing it down. Not because she's dumb, but like, I want to hear what she has to say at that next level. Yeah. Right. Like, like I want to hear, well, or, you know, for example, like a conversation between her and Seth Godin, like that's where you see or that's where someone like me as another branding expert, like that's the table I want to hang at. Yes, but realizing yes. that Marie is having to, you know, quote unquote, dumb it down. And I'm, I don't say that in like a, I'm not trying to be derogatory at all no, toward her or people who are consuming her stuff. But she's having to, again, meet people where they're at. And if they yes. know nothing about branding or customer profile avatars or any of that stuff, then she's doing them a huge service. I mean, she has propelled an entire, you know, little generation, little army of people who probably wouldn't have been creative entrepreneurs without the work that she does. For sure. She's so many, and so, so many people's entry point, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, even probably people like um, Brene Brown, I'm sure that some of her peers are like, come on, Brene, you're really dumbing it down in that book. You know, whenever they're probably having like very high, high mm -hmm. concept theoretical yeah. conversations about shame and vulnerability, she's helping translate it in a way that the general public can understand it and in a way that it can change our lives. Yes. Yeah. And I, that's, I think that's an amazing part of the service. So, all right. In terms of being boss, there's, first of all, how did you guys pick that name? I don't think I ever asked you that before. I'm so <laughs> curious. Um, so we actually took being boss through the braid method. Oh, cool. of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so my sister helped us by hearing what we were saying. And, you know, funny enough, like as we were taking it through the braid method, we were like, how woo woo do we get with it? Because Emily and I are both very into magic and metaphysics and all these things. Um, but kind of that idea of meeting people where they're at, you know, like we, we just, we made it very intentional in our branding not to get to, um, to woo with it. And I use the word woo in a positive way as well. Yeah. I know some people think it's negative. Anyway, um, so it was going to be called the Emily and Kathleen show. And I'm so glad it's not. <laughs> Whenever we were going through. <laughs> <laughs> when you just said that, I was also very glad that it's not. I know, right? Like, ugh. I also like the idea of being boss. Like, I think that it's a brand that people have been able to embrace for themselves, um, which is something I wasn't anticipating, but I'm so glad that I created a brand that could be so much bigger than us yeah, that other yeah. people could take on as their own in many ways. Um, so we were going through the braid method and I can't remember what it was, but we knew that we didn't love the working title of the podcast. Yeah. And so whenever we were just going through what our positioning and messaging and values were, um, the word boss was coming up a lot. And at the time, Sophia Amoruso's book, Girl Boss, had recently uh -huh. come out. And so that was in the stratosphere. And we didn't want to rip that off. But we also wanted to leverage this momentum of yeah. being boss that was happening. And so that's kind of how it happened. I appreciate that as well, because my in wanting to change the name of this show from Untame the Wild Soul to Truth Telling with Elizabeth Dialto. Um, the timing of it was funny because I decided in December 2017 and then it was January at the Grammys when Oprah said her 
quote about, you know, speaking our truths is one of the best tools any of us have. That's a paraphrase. It wasn't the exact quote. And, you know, but truth telling is very universal. This isn't like, this isn't a trend. This isn't new. It's certainly something that people are elevating right now. And so I had the same exact, like, I don't want to rip this off and I don't want to look like I'm hopping on a bandwagon because this is always, if you ask my mom, this has been how I roll since I was three years old. But um, most people are like, obviously, Elizabeth, (laughs) you didn't have to tell us (laughs) that. But um, yeah, exact same thing. And there's also a cool momentum around it that I'm like, this is a really great time to be making this yeah. change. I feel like that's part, part of entrepreneurship is, is noticing like what works for you and also what works for right now in the times. Yeah. You know, I mean, I wish that I had more of a marketing mind like sooner, but whenever I went into naming being boss, I wasn't specifically thinking, oh, we should have a name that is more marketable so that whenever it's on a book, it'll look really good on an airport shelf. Like that was never, I'm just always so in the moment with what I'm creating that I never think about like how it's going to play out in the market. And I don't think you can do that. Like I think that you just have to name things what you want to name them and really do some exploring and figure out what resonates. And I think this is why it's also so important for creatives to be in touch with their values and intentions and even their bodies so that whenever I say something like being boss, I can feel it in my stomach. Like that feels good. Yeah. yeah. That was actually, that was why when I said, I'm really glad you didn't choose Emily and Kathleen. It was just cause that was just flat. But when you say being boss, it, like I feel grounded. I do. It's like, Oh, uh, like there's power, there's strength behind that. Yeah. 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 And how much fun is it to like call your people bosses? I just think that would be the best to be like, what's I up bosses? I love it so much. <laughs> I love it. And we have a secret handshake and. Oh Yeah. I mean, there is a little bit of it that I like I have an ampersand tattooed on my ribs and then ampersands exploded. And so there is a little bit of that with the word boss like it has. And of course, girl boss was out first. And that's probably one of the reasons why. But um, I'm seeing a lot of boss stuff. And I don't know. So then it's like, oh, am I just like everyone else. Yeah. You know, there's a little bit of that if I'm going to tell the truth here, Yeah, but overall, I mean, I'm certainly, I'm, I'm super proud of the name and yeah, we're we're really sunk up for the same for me, like wild, wild soul. I started noticing, not that it didn't exist like before, certainly did. Um, I started noticing way more of it. And then as I started calling a lot of my things like untame yourself or unconsume yourself, and then seeing other, other type of stuff like that, there was part of me that was like, I just don't, I can't, there's such a deep desire to be, whether it's original or to just like not be in a pool with people. (laughs) Right. I love truth telling because I feel like it's, um, like so much quieter, but like, I I can imagine sitting around a campfire, right? Like where, where do you tell your truth? Mm -hmm. And it feels so like intimate. Oh, I like that. So What's in the book? Tell us more about the book from, from your mm-hmm. perspective. I just, I love, I love asking authors because something I've been thinking about recently, I recently interviewed Trevor Hall and he was talking about his albums and this interesting way he's released his most recent album. And actually I think his interview was like the week or two before yours is coming out. So it should have already been up. But, um, I had actually never thought about this when I buy an album or like back in the day when I used to buy whole albums instead of just download the song that I heard that I liked. Um, there would always be like one or two songs that like weren't on the radio that I loved. And so I feel like books are the same way, right? Like there's probably chapters that you guys are like, this one's so good. And I know you're in pre-order right now, but when the book like hits the shelves and people, you start to get the feedback. It's always so interesting. You'll probably be like, they loved this. That wasn't even, that was my least favorite chapter. So I like to ask what you love about your own book is essentially oh, the reason. And I love that you're asking it before I'm starting to see some of that feedback roll in because we are in the pre-order phase. I think that one of the parts that I had the most fun writing was my official love for Beyonce. Like I have a, it's just one page, but it's kind of like my, what would Beyonce do and how much I admire her and how much I've drawn from her in my own bossness and encouraging other people to find those figures in their lives um, that they can really draw that strength from. Again, we're all connected and that Beyonce part of us, right? 
So really, though, being able to finally articulate exactly what it is about Beyonce that I love and admire was really cool to get to do. And then to encourage, hopefully, people who are reading the book to figure out who's sitting around their dinner table. Is it Beyonce? Is it um, Stephen Hawking? You know, like, who is it that they are hanging out with and drawing knowledge and power from? Who else would be at your table? Beyonce? Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson is usually there. Um, Who else is there? I mean, like Obama would be really great to have dinner with. I think um, someone maybe like Alana Glazer. I'm saying that because you look like her. People tell me that all the time. time. I'm sure. Did you ever cut bangs? No. You know what happened? So if anyone listening doesn't follow me on social media, I love that you just asked me this. I made, there was uh, months ago, I, my hair was down and I like, I was like, what would I look like with bangs? You know, like when you're bored, you're tired of your own face and you just want to do something different. I was having one of those moments and I pulled it up and I'm like, Ooh, this actually looks, I like this. So I decided to do a little poll on Insta stories and people were like, yes, get bangs. So I scheduled a haircut and I went, And the guy, I went to a curly hair specialist and the guy was like, let me tell you something. Do you like doing your hair? I was like, no, I don't want to spend any. I want to spend zero minutes on my hair every day. (laughs) Negative five minutes. And he's like, okay, I have a cowlick on my hairline. He's like, bangs, you'll have to do your hair if you want those bangs to look the way you think they're going to look when you just pull up your hair and go, look how cute it looks. (laughs) He turned me away. He wouldn't cut my hair that day. Actually, and it's funny that you asked me this right now, because just three days ago, I went, it was, t- I was finally, he's like, wait three months. Your last haircut was horrendous. Look, he put me in the mirror. He showed me. He was like, here, here, and here. You see that? And I'm like, I do now. <laughs> I had no idea how shitty my haircut was. And I went back and he's like, so we're working on it. We're on like a long-term plan, but I'm not, I don't have the head for bangs. It was so disappointing because I really wanted them. I know. So you did that post. And I was like, well, maybe I should cut bangs because I'm a curly girl. Also, <laughs> I towel dried my hair yesterday. So some of the curl fell out, Yeah, which I kind of like. I like mixing it, it up great. a little yeah. bit. So I thought I should cut some bangs and it's getting long enough where I feel like there would be enough yeah. difference. Anyway, I'm afraid that they would do this thing. Right. I don't know. Like, like, like a M, mustache instead of Like a of curly, bangs. yes. Like a curly <laughs> M mustache <laughs> on the top of my head, which is what my bangs did whenever I was a kid yeah. and didn't do my hair. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I had bangs when so I So I think I'm just going to, I'm on a long term plan too, which is stop cutting it. Just, just let it go. Let it go. So I know we were talking about the book. No, it's okay. You said Alana Glazer. This this is why. Oh, yeah. More people. Okay. So I'm so inspired by comedians. And so like Jessica Williams, Two Dope Queens, like having both of them at the table. I I really like comedians and I just want to be surrounded by them because I think that they are so funny on stage and these really great performers are observing life through a very specific lens. And then they are, you know, storytelling. Um, but then in their personal lives, and if you listen to podcasts with comedians speaking to each other, just as people not performing, you realize that they're just battling all the same stuff that all of us are. And more often than not, they suffer from things like depression or stuff like that, um, that they're really struggling with. And I just think that they're super inspiring. I love the craft of comedy and I would love to learn more about it and what goes into it. But I'm also afraid that would ruin the magic a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Of it. It's so funny you say that because the creative process of comedians is one of my favorites. Have you ever listened to Whitney Cummings' first interview on the Tim Ferriss podcast? No, I've been listening to her stuff recently since she's been doing a lot of interviews recently because a book came out and I think she has a show coming out. But I should listen to that. Was, I read her book. I was so impressed with her creative process. Okay. And, and it was just cool. And yeah, yeah, for all the things that you just said about comedians, I, I love that too. Because again, they are. They're observing life. They're storytelling. And even for me, even in this new brand, in this truth telling, there's a part of me, the very first thing I ever wanted to be when I was little was a comedian. My brother actually is one, which is awesome. He's like fulfilling <gasps> a dream so for both cool. of us. And, but now, especially I'm going to be speaking more, that is something that I get to do. Because I have yeah. such a like vibrant sense of humor. I am so easily entertained and like entertainable in life that um, that stuff just comes out and I'm so observant. So I kind of am built like a comedian 
Yeah. So I feel like I get to bring in the part of me that has always wanted to be a comedian into what I do more, way more now. It's very exciting. You know, I think I was struggling a little bit from burnout last year, like just working, working, working. And then I had nothing left to say because I was just in the (laughs) grind. So like on being boss, for example, I was like, I have nothing left to say because I haven't been in the work. (laughs) And I heard a comedian talking about like whenever you start hearing other comedians, like the big, big shots, whenever they just start making jokes about being in airports, you know that they're working too much because that's the only life that they're living is in airports. And I really took from that and thought like, okay, this is a really tangible example of why I need to step out of being so busy and living life. So I have more to observe. So really learning from that creative process was huge from comedians. And I think this also speaks to something that we've been talking about a lot on the show in more recent months, which is we have to get out of our bubbles. And this was in Braving the Wilderness and Brene's most recent book. We have to get out of our bubbles. We cannot just stay and reinforce our bubbles with our same people who look like us and think like us and vote like us and dress like us and go to the same schools and everything. Because then, I mean, it isn't just about your work or your livelihood, but your worldview becomes so stale and so narrow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about that whenever you said that you were kind of shifting who your offering is going to attract and go to. Sometimes I have a hard time with that because I have created such a bubble that I can't even imagine that there are people who would be too scared to become creative entrepreneurs. Right. You know what I mean? Like I've just been in this mode, but it also can get really frustrating whenever I think about that because it feels like, you know, if everyone's life coaches, for example, then who's actually like being coached and what are they being coached for? Like if we're all professional cheerleaders, who's actually playing the game? Right. Right. (laughs) And so I think that's another really good reason to expand your bubble so that you don't feel like you're just on the sidelines. So you can really feel like you're in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I love that so much. So people can get the book on Amazon. They can get it. When will it actually be in bookstores if people are old school and they do that? Right. Well, I highly recommend going to your independent bookstore and asking them to carry it and buying it there. Um, And getting the printed book is a must because it's beautiful. Like this is the most beautiful business book you will ever see. It is full color. It's kind of oversized. It has worksheets in it that you can write in and it will be available on April 10th, but you can pre-order now um, wherever books are sold. And yeah, we're super excited. It's full color. It has photos in it. And I love it's that. just beautiful. I love a book that, I mean, I get up and write in any book anyway. So amazing. If you're watching, you could see it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love when, when something is actually intended for that. Okay. I want to wrap up by asking you some questions that have nothing to do with anything. Kind of. I love it. All right. Do you watch TV? Yes. What do you watch? What are like three or five shows that you're watching right now? Schitt's Creek. That's a show I've never even heard of. Oh my gosh. It is so good. I'm just going to spend the next five minutes talking about Shit's Creek. So it's created by Dan Levy, Dan Levy and Eugene Levy. So Eugene Levy is the dad from American Pie, like with the big oh, eyebrows. Yes, yes. And his son, Dan Levy, Catherine O'Hara from um, Beetlejuice uh-huh. and um, what's that Macaulay Culkin movie? Home Alone. Uh-huh. So Catherine O'Hara, she is in it as well. She's the mom. Anyway, it's this family who's like incredibly wealthy and then they lose all their money in like one of those Bernie Madoff scams and they have to move to this town called Schitt's Creek and they live in the motel there. And the sense of style that Dan Levy and Catherine O'Hara have, like I want to dress like them 100% of the time. And it's just so funny and witty and it's 20 minutes long, which is perfect for me because by the time I get my kid to bed and whatever, I only really have 20 minutes a day to watch TV. Um, I just started Letterman's new show on Netflix. I started the Obama one. I didn't finish it yet. Yeah. Um, Dave Chappelle, his specials. Yep. I mean, so good girl. I'm in one of them. What? Yeah. At the end. So I can't, I get, I still, people are still sending me the screenshots when he was in LA towards uh, like the, like the last four minutes, it pans out to the audience and you see me laughing my face off. (laughs) So you were actually there. Yeah. What was that like? It was awesome. I, mean, I love Chappelle. I love Chappelle. He came to my college in oh, like the early, it, it, I went to college in 2001. So somewhere between 2001 and 2005, I don't remember what year it was, but when his very first hour, which I think was called The Critic's Choice. So I've seen Dave Chappelle live 
back then. And then this was my second time. It was two years ago. It was so good. I, I think he's so funny. And, th- you know, this is something that I've also been in exploration of. It's like the, the morality around comedy and like how does comedy intersect with justice and problematic mm-hmm. messaging. Uh, but I think he, he really toes the line. He crosses it yep. sometimes. But I think yep. more than anything, he is of high service, especially the most yep. recent one. That one, I don't know what town he was in, but he's just like sitting on a stage and it's a small yes. venue. I yes. thought he got so real. I was like, yes, yes, Dave Chappelle. Yes. I was so incredibly inspired and ah, uh, just I think he's a genius. And the way he towed that line and even crossed it and then came back over. Yeah. I just think he did it so well. And uh, yeah. And I mean, I, I've gotten to the point where. I feel like it's really hard to say anything. I feel like anything I say or am not saying is under a microscope sometimes, if only by myself, right. you know, like, am I saying what it needs to be said anyway? So I think he just did such a great job. I'm also watching the great British bake off. That's oh. a good one too. Like if you just need to chill great British and bake not off. think about work or anything, the great British bake off is I'm, so good. I'm so happy since I started asking people this question. Cause again, like we, we live in our bubbles. So I just watched, I had only been watching like Jimmy Fallon, um, you know, scandal, how to get away with murder, some like real usual suspect mainstream shows. And so I'm learning all these things. Now I, I basically always have something to watch now. Not that that's a good thing. Um, are you reading anything right now? Yes, I'm reading Becoming Supernatural, which is the meditation. It's a meditation book that has gotten me real excited about all of that. I'm kind of reading it like a skeptic. Like I find myself falling into these moments of skepticism and, you know, becoming cynical about it. And I don't want to. So I'm just trying to stay really open as I'm reading this. I don't even know why I have to disclaim it and say that. I think it's because I imagine <laughs> someone else reading this and be like, Kathleen believes this, but like right. kind of, yeah, yeah, I yeah, kind of do. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I always have a bunch of books going. I just read John Hodgman's Vacation Land, which are you familiar with him? He was on The no, Daily Show no. sometimes. Uh, he was the PC in the Mac PC commercials. Oh, no way. Yeah. So anyway, he kind of, his delivery has always kind of annoyed me. I feel bad saying that. Like if he were listening to this interview, I wouldn't want him to he- hear me say that. But um, reading this book was it was really good. I don't know. I really enjoyed it. I his his ability to string sentences together was impressive. Cool. So um, I don't want this interview to end. I like you so much. I feel like we'd be BFFs for real. I feel like we like so many <laughs> of the same things that we geek out on a lot of the same stuff. So I'm going to send you an email later about that. I know. But we need to hang out. We really do. In the meantime, thank you so much. This was super fun. And so for anyone listening, if you are into creativity, if you are into entrepreneurship, if you are a creative entrepreneur, the converse, com- combination of the two, definitely check out the Being Boss book. Check out the Being Boss podcast. It's I like that you have co-hosts. There's just like this added layer of dynamics. We'll put also the link to my interview on your show. We'll put that in the show notes if people want to get started somewhere and feel familiar. They can start with my episode. And then um, this is episode number 247. So if you're listening and you want to check out links to all the stuff we talked about, go to untameyourself.com forward slash T as in truth, T as in telling dash 247. All right, Kathleen, you are amazing. Thank you so, so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. And when my, when my dad passed away, um, from cancer, I started becoming obsessed with the health side of things. And that kind of led me down this path of like becoming a nutritionist, like learning every single nutritional science fact there is to know. And then realizing that I had developed another breed of (laughs) my addiction, which was basically just like becoming obsessed with clean eating and health. And I was vegan and gluten-free and sugar-free and everything free. And to the point where I was like, okay, I'm running out of things that I can eat now. Um, and so it was then that I realized that, okay, nutrition isn't the answer here. Um, cause I still don't love myself. I'm still in this war with myself. So finding all the nutrition information out didn't help me. 